And we are as a people, inherently and historically, Wake up. opposed to the secret societies, the se secret oaths, and the secret proceedings. The show that asks questions about why we don't ask questions. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Welcome to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. These are the conspiracy queries that Alan Park is asking. And some people are listening. And you're one of them. So thanks. And there's a lot of people popping up around the world. So that's nice. Um, I really appreciate that. And, and a lot of the letters and, and comments that have been coming in um, on the different ways through Stitcher and, and Twitter and Gmail and everything, it's fantastic. So thanks for listening. And I'm glad some of you are enjoying what is happening here, at least um, interested enough to find out. We have a great guest today. Jamie DeWolf is back, and he's going to talk about Scientology. Now, um, as I said before, uh, everybody has a crazy uncle. <laughs> you don't have anything on Jamie DeWolf. He's got a crazy great-grandfather uh, that were, these guys were uh, heavily, well, they are, Scientology. And he is the, um, he is the spurned son. He, he realized what a scam that was. And decided to um, write about it, expose it, and uh, performance art, poetry, acting. He's a heck of a guy, fascinating individual, and I think uh, deserves uh, the tip of the hat for being able to take what what I think would be a horrible upbringing and turn it into something um, that's beneficial for not only his his own self but everybody else. So Jamie DeWolf in a couple of minutes, and before that, before that, we also have um, a fantastic. I've already said that too many times. We have a a great event coming up in Oshawa um, for you folks that need to get more information than is on the what they call the news. And uh, it's coming up at the end of April. And one of the purveyors of information is a guest on the show, Nelson Thal. He is going to come on in a couple of minutes and talk about this event that you don't want to miss if you're in the GTA and, as they say, the greater Toronto area or southern Ontario um, or just even over the border into New York. How are you guys doing over there? Rochester, snow, Buffalo. Wow, you're back. Um, welcome. So he's going to be on in a little bit. But before we get to any of this, um, I guess you guys all heard about what happened in France and how there were shootings. And some people on my show and others have said that these shootings were not necessarily as um, as shown and that there was some uh, secret weird kind of manipulation going on. That's definitely the case in Canada with Operation Determined Dragon, the DND military operation that enveloped, completely surrounded the window of time that the guys uh, that were killed in Canada, the uh, unfortunate victims of bullets flying from crazy people, no doubt. That is not in question. What's in question was ultimately who was in control, who was pulling the trigger. Um, why did the American media know the name and identity of the shooter in Canada before the Canadian media did? And then sort of, you know, not mention that again. CBS had that thing within 10 or 20 minutes of, of him uh, shooting it up. But we didn't in Canada. We didn't know, but they did. I love how the states always knows things is going on somewhere else, but never what's going on right above, say, New York City's giant skyscrapers and maybe the biggest military installation in the world. Weren't too sure what was going on that day. Took them all day to figure it out. But somehow if a, if a plane <laughs> disappears from the Ukraine area, they know right away. Definitely it's Russia's fault. They're right in, wired in. Oh, yeah, it's completely believable. Anyway. Uh, so France had this unfortunate, terrible shooting at the Charlie Hebdo satirical magazine. And, and the leaders came out later and said, Je suis Charlie. And they marched around in a similar looking street that was cordoned off by police so that the precious friggin' leaders wouldn't have to sully their clothes with actual protest. While they artificially said, yes, yes, freedom of speech, je suis Charlie. So now let's now let's bring you up to date on what's happening. Here's an article by Thierry Meissen. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's a French gentleman, and I'm not. T-H-I-E-R-R-Y-M-E-Y-S-S-A-N. This fellow also wrote a great explanation of how things uh, didn't really sit too well with him, 9-11 explanation-wise. And so on the VoltaireNet.org, it says, At the request of President Francois Hollande, <clears throat> the French Prime Minister. 
The French Socialist Party has published a note on the international conspiracy theorist movement, his goal to prepare new legislation prohibiting it to express itself. That's right. The French government is trying to set up a series of laws where it will be illegal to discuss conspiracy. Wow. You know, if I tried to come up with a better way in one sentence to prove that conspiracies are real, I would never have been smart enough to come up with that. <laughs> it's never been smart enough to come up with. Um, don't ever talk about this, okay? That just reeks of conspiracy. But, you know, speaking of reeks, Francois Hollande's probably eating some kind of French cheese while he dreamed this thing up. His goal is to prepare new legislation prohibiting it to express itself. In the U.S., September 11, 2001, coup established a permanent state of emergency, the Patriot Act, launching a series of imperial wars. Gradually, the European elites have aligned with their counterparts across the Atlantic. Everywhere, people are worried about being abandoned by their states and they question their institutions seeking to retain power. The elites are now ready to use force to gag their opposition. That's what's happening with the five eyes, as far as I can see it. Edward Nor uh, Snowden. I was going to say Edward Norton. should probably play him in the movie. Um, they've got the five eyes where everybody spies on everybody in the big countries, you know. New Zealand spies on Australia, who spies on England, who spies on Canada, who spies on the United States, and then they have a plausible deniability. And I used to have a joke in my act years ago. Why don't they have the balls to just... Tell everybody, hey, we're going to look at what you guys are doing instead of fobbing it off onto the neighbors and plausible. Di and that's what they're doing now. My ridiculous joke of 10 years ago has actually come true. That's disappointing. So, um, yeah. So Francis, uh, what's his name? Francois Hollande says. Anti-Semitism maintains conspiracy theories that spread without limits. Conspiracy theories that have in the past led to the worst. Whatever that means. The answer is to realize that conspiracy theories are disseminated through the Internet and social networks. So don't look at information and don't hang out with your friends. Moreover, we must remember that it is words that have in the past prepared extermination. Yeah. We need to act at the European level and even internationally so that a legal framework can be defined so that Internet platforms that manage social networks are held to account and that sanctions be opposed for failure to enforce. Folks like me that are happy to reveal that these people are lying you into an unfree poorhouse. And they are kicking up those surveillance towers. And we got to stop this thing. I don't know how. I don't know how. I don't have any... I'm not going to say guns and killing and all that. I'm not going to do that kind of thing. That's not interesting to me. And I don't think it's the right answer. And it's what got us into the mess in the first place. So, with that kicking around your head, let's find out a little bit more from uh, Jamie DeWolf now. We're going to start off with him, and the reason I wanted to have him back on the show is because he has uh, some pretty fascinating theories about the origins of ISIS and Scientology. So, stick around and uh, listen to some great interviews. We've got two of them, so let's go to our first interview, and then we'll go to our second interview. <laughs> Jamie is um, knows a lot about Scientology. I'm going to venture probably more than you. And we'll cover a little ground about um, who Jamie is and why he knows these things. It's available on the previous show from last year, but we'll just do a quick once-over about Jamie's grandfather and some other people just to kind of catch you up. L. Ron Hubbard was actually my great-grandfather, and my grandfather was L. Ron Hubbard Jr. And then my mother was his first child. So... I think one of the I think one of the most fascinating parts of my family history is, is not just the L. Ron Hubbard but the L. Ron Hubbard Junior as well. Because I think within their story um is basically kind of the narrative of a lot of the church itself. You have someone that became an early disciple and then helped construct the church, was also involved in some of this kind of abusive and physicalized violence at an early level and ended up leaving the church and was silent for a bit when he came out and then eventually started to turn towards unveiling who his father actually was and then paid a very steep price for it and basically spent much of the end of his life battling his father and, and being consumed by the cold and fighting against his security apparatus and investigators and blackmail and all of that jazz. And so, in a way, it's that their tale itself is the same tale you're seeing now um, that's even happening with people leaving the church, like 
Marty Rathburn and Mike Rinder and so forth, two people who are at the top level, and they're involved in many kind of criminal activities in, in terms of using the cult power against its own members and anybody that would try to bring forth the truth. And then when they leave, they're also suffered, I mean, they're subjected to the same sort of, of aggression that they had enacted on their own members before. And, you know, inevitably they, they try to unveil the truth. Except the difference is now is that, of course, that L. Ron Hubbard is, is long gone and David Miscavige has taken that role. David Miscavige, yes. And and so with these, uh, you've been on both sides of the issue. You you've seen it from the the Scientology world, from from a place of a lot of your family members being greatly concerned and upset that this is even going on, and then other ones actually championing the cause as a wonderful thing. And that that's a bit of a, a tug of war for you to grow up in. Right. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much fear that surrounds it. Um, you know, and absolutely, our family wanted to protect us from really getting drowned in this entire kind of cesspool and to keep us from it as, as far as possible. And I think part of it is that I wanted to understand who who my great-grandfather was and as being a redhead and, you know, having to engage in sort of duels with psychiatrists when I was an adolescent and trying to understand my own sort of like mental history along with that of my brother, who were both pretty hyper when we were young and and had a lot of problems in school and, and kind of tendencies towards youthful violence and, and that kind of stuff that, um, you know, has changed and evolved over time and it's something that's a lot more healthy. But back then, trying to understand who this guy actually was and realizing that he was an enigma to even most of my family um, and and that there was this entire terror of anyone poking around this sleeping giant that they felt that their own father... Um, you know, uh, L. Ron Jr. had basically had been consumed by. And and so even now, there's some family members that won't talk about it at all, and they, they're not even really that interested in discussing it. Um, it still has a certain amount of menace associated with it. Sure. And then I have other family members who, you know, in a way, they, they either privately or publicly, like, kind of champion the fact that I ended up coming out and, and speaking about it. Um, probably because I... I realized that, that the story of my grandfather isn't that well-known of L. Ron Jr., and it's, it's a pretty haunting story in a way, and I think that there's something so identifiable in a son and a father wrestling with each other and, and, and sort of turn, you know, turning their own lives into ashes as they battle each other. And in a way, L. Ron Jr., when he came out, he was one of the first people who was actually really pushing for more of an honest portrayal of who his father really was and was crucified pretty early on for it. Mm. So, and now, how do you spend most of your time? Like, what is it that you do about this? You're obviously not keeping it a secret anymore. You're on this show and many others talking about it. But what, what is your goal now with having seen it as dark as it is and, and, and getting out from underneath of it, Scientology? Well, a lot of it is, to be honest, is I'm a performer and a filmmaker, and I do shows all over the U.S., all over the world, and, you know, plays and films and so on and so forth. And a lot of it is that when I first performed a story about it, I, I really just wanted to have a story out there and just to just tell my family's story because I felt that it wasn't, it hadn't really been told. And a lot of that was mostly just for my family and for those who didn't want to speak. And I think now when I get requests to talk, I usually grant them if I can, partly because I think it's important that that these kinds of stories aren't silenced, that they get exposed. And I mean, because I don't, I don't view them as a religion. I view them as a criminal organization. Um, they've been, you know, they have billions of dollars in assets, and they have been, you know, they've been accused, and, and there's a lot of evidence for slave labor camps and forcing women to have abortions and wow. you know and the fact is that I mean their entire messiah figure was a pathological liar and <laughs> yeah. so everything that has become an extension from that um, the sad fact of it is is that he got everything he wanted he died rich he died with this entire army in his disposal he died insulated he died with you know, thousands of people believing this fictitious tale that he told about himself, but he's gone. So to 
continue, continue to exploit the members and continue to exploit the world um, simply because of his purposes and his agenda that he had set in stone is no longer necessary. So it's like the least we can do is expose him for who, who he truly was and you know, allow people to, to make their own decisions. So these days it's, it's being run and operated or uh, uh, captained, shall we say, a bit of an in-joke, um, with, with this David Miscavige. And so he's not, um, he's not any of the uh, actual Scientologists, you know, the, the, the genetic link that is the, uh, the Hubbard family. And does he therefore have an easier time uh, selling this stuff, not in his name, the way, the way uh, those other guys were hanging it, uh, you know, on the, very, on the very selves, you know? It's like, I invented this thing, and obviously Miss Cabbage didn't and doesn't say he does. So does he have an easier time, as you say, running this thing um, like a very wise uh, opponent, a political organization? Yeah, I think that David Miscavige basically runs it like a lieutenant or an administrator or a very brutal CEO. And I think that there is a lot to be said. And what they're hoping for is that, stre- that stretch of time where when someone dies, you can continue to add more myth to their legend and at a certain point make someone you know, larger than life and someone that is less and less connections with reality. The problem is that Elrond was spinning these tales when he was still alive and he had living evidence that was saying otherwise. He had his own family. He had his own son. You know, he had his own military record. And what happens now is you play the game where you try to spin this entire myth of who L. Ron Hubbard was, who, of course, is now gone and doesn't have to go on record, doesn't have to have a microphone shoved in his face. And David Miscavige can basically just continue to echo the same propagated falsehoods that Elrond said about himself. Um, the difference is, and, and sort of the weakness of that, though, is David Miscavige is not Elrond Hubbard and doesn't have, or even really pretend to, have the same kind of hustler charisma that he did. And at the same time, Elrond wrote kind of a fatal flaw into the DNA of Scientology theology, which is that no one can add to it but him. So oh. they're absolutely stuck with this theology and this kind of um, <laughs> That's... Pyramid, scam, pyramid scam that can't add any more steps. Even the Christians there's, figure there's that no out. I mean, even stuff. even after a while, the Pope was able to say, okay, okay, the world is really round. We were wrong about this. Sorry, Copernicus. You know, at exactly. least they got to fudge the it. Pope, and... The Pope in the last 30 years <laughs> can actually, actually uh, decide that purgatory was a theological hypothesis and just eliminated entirely. I, personally, I do like when they come up with those, though. Uh, I do personally enjoy the adjustments based on um, uh, impending, you know, unavoidable logic and fact. That it, okay, okay, we used to say this, now we're going to say this. But Scientology does not have that angle. No, I mean, it, it, partly it's because when Dianetics first came out, and what a lot of people don't really seem to get and I think it's a very strong, uh, fundamental, like, kind of underpinning to the evolution of Scientology itself is that it originally was not meant to be, it was not designed to be a religion. Right. It was designed to be a science. You know, L. Ron Hubbard really postulated himself as uh, a scientist. That's why he really pushed for this kind of, um, you know, that he had taken these nuclear physics classes and had, you know, studied with all of these great fountains of wisdom is that Dianetics, when it originally came out, was you know the new science of the modern mind. It was meant to be a science, not a religion. And the problem is when you have something in science, you actually need case studies, you actually need evidence. And so when he was starting to get grilled and roasted on that, then he transformed into a religion. But we also realized, though, that when you teach a science, a science has to be something that can be replicated, right? If I, you know, if I teach you how to... Uh, do any kind of a scientific process, there's a list of steps for it that you in France or Norway or, or South America, you can replicate the same process. That's, and what was happening with Dianetics, the people are taking Dianetics, and they didn't need L. Ron Hubbard anymore. And they're starting to go off in their own way and develop and use these tools and tricks and so forth. And, you know, you don't want that to happen with, with religion without you able to get a, a piece of the proceeds. Um, the problem is now, though, is that there's something he basically wrote into it that I alone am the only one that can ever write 
or edit or change any word of it. And the problem is, though, that that sticks them with the more kind of psychotic levels of Scientology with your genie levels and your, you know, the space <laughs> infestations of alien dead souls in your body. You can't really change that because it's, it's written in the entire script. And so the best thing they can do now is just keep shoving the same product on their members. And I think that that's what's exhausting a lot of even the old vanguard who are at this point, you know, kind of leading in droves because the, you know, the, there's just nothing left to sell. Nothing left. Wow. Well, tell us this then. Um, well, before we do that, let's let's just take a quick break and, and jump away. We are listening to uh, Jamie DeWolf. He's the guest today on Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Sirius XM Channel 167. We'll be right back. As I said, we are right back, and we're with Jamie DeWolf, and uh, he is telling us about Scientology. Jamie, the last time we spoke, you were telling me about how uh, your, your grandfather was kind of an enforcer, keeping everybody to the task of the... Uh, religion or whatever it was at the idea at the time, a fantasy, a science fiction, but he held them to this. And then later, through the course of time and, and, and the uh, organization being around for quite some many years, it is a, as you've described it, highly organized and efficient opponent. And that it has, um, when I say opponent, it has any anybody that counters it, I guess, would, would count as an opponent. And also tell us something a little bit about the mentality of an organization that is, you know, supposed to be the answer, but at the same time they are highly organized, efficient, opponent, and, and very wise, and, and had a thing going on called Operation Snow White, which sounds more like a military application of, of intelligence than anything else. Do you, can you fill in some blanks there? When my grandfather first started in Scientology, this is Elon Albert Jr., when he first became a member of Scientology and worked with his father, the very kind of easy hustle of Scientology is you come in under the presumption that you're going to be doing a course of self-betterment. And while doing that course, you do with auditing sessions, which is basically kind of a data version uh, a psychiatry you know, session of hypnosis. And you're holding a form of, of a lie detector, basically, sort of an, it's called an e-meter. And you're kind of subjecting yourself to this kind of hypnotic interrogation that is going to be digging through your past traumas, your your secrets, your sexuality, your um, you know everything that has ever ever triggered you throughout most of your life. Okay. Now a lot of it is going to be the idea that you're going to be becoming a better human being by discussing all these things. But what they don't really tell you, and, and what's often not focused on, is that they record all of your confessions. And if you try to leave, they're going to use it against you. And that's what my grandfather would do constantly when he had people trying to leave the church, especially if they're thinking in a good amount of cash, is they had already confessed their infidelities, their uh, sexual proclivities. And, you know, he had a lot of that on file. <clears throat> and himself, as, you know, as a bit of an auditor, that that was a way for him to push people to you know, not go too far from the church and make sure that they came back. Wow. And so when he even saw that early on that there was this whole other darker apparatus of Scientology that was getting constructed, part of that was because Elrond was so absolutely paranoid at kind of a base level because in a way, as a good con man, he was always aware of the different angles that people could come at him for. He had a lot to hide. He had a lot of money he needed to funnel. He had uh, sort of a, kind of a fanatical faction that was starting to surround him. And he began to create his own secret police, um, which in the early days was known as the Guardian Office, and which is now known as OSA, the Operation of Special Affairs. And in this Guardian Office, and this is all verified, this is, this is you know, people went to jail over this, and there's a slew of paperwork and evidence for this that led to FBI raids um, nationwide on Scientology offices. So anybody can look this up. And I think a lot of people in America absolutely are just not aware that one of the greatest counter, you know, intelligence surveillance operations in American history on domestic soil was enacted by Scientology. 
entire religion that has this tax exempt status. And a lot of the top ranked members, including L. Ron Hubbard's own wife, went to jail for this. And that was sending Scientology agents uh, to cover into all kinds of different branches of government, from the IRS, State Department, uh, FBI, um, in all these offices, and sometimes in the guise of clerical jobs. And they would basically do Watergate style break ins of, huh. you know, breaking into offices, uh, copying any kind of information that was available on Scientology because a lot of these different arms of the government had different investigations into what this new cult was really about. Where is their money going? Why are there so many alarming reports about them? And Scientology was absolutely on the attack and wanted to destroy their own opposition, break it into psychiatrists, office, all this kind of stuff, looking for this dirt and incriminating information, also to understand what the government had and what they didn't have. And that led to the government raiding Scientology offices where they found out all the paperwork and protocols explaining all of this in great detail because Scientology is incredibly efficient at keeping all of these records. <laughs> uh, a lot of people went to jail over it. And Elron went into hiding after that and basically was one of the most elusive people of uh, you know the last century. I mean, he basically like pulled a bin Laden and was just like running around all over the world, running around the country. And they had a whole lot of people pulling all kinds of different counter surveillance tactics in order to hide him. And that was what was Operation Snow White. That, Operation Snow White was part of many operations, and that was the way that they dealt with the world, is their entire maxim was always attack, never defend, and that they were constantly trying to destroy their opposition. And they were highly organized and worked in a very kind of militaristic structure of you know, a certain level of efficiency. So, I mean, these aren't, uh, you know, these aren't some just whack jobs, you know, running around in a commune. Right. You know, these are incredibly efficient, intelligent people. And I think in a way is that at the higher level of Scientology, it becomes kind of intoxicating to have this sort of fanatical holy mission of you're trying to protect this theology that you believe is a true religion um, that was invented by this, this genius of the last century, Elon Hubbard, among the most misunderstood geniuses of the last century, they believe, um, someone who had unlocked secrets of the mind that were so dangerous that you have this entire worldwide, you know, uh, conglomerates of, of all the most powerful people trying to destroy L. Ron Hubbard and his religion. I mean, it has this whole sort of fanatical uh, philosophy behind it, so it really inspires them to crush their opposition at all costs because Scientologists at the top levels, they are told over and over that we alone are saving the world and that without us, the world is going to be suffered to you know, nuclear annihilation. So without your efforts and without destroying our enemies, it's going to end. That's what you said, we alone are staying in the world. So that the, you're saying the, the Scientologists believe that after whatever kind of terrible stuff happens here, if there's an, a nuclear meltdown, they'll still be here. That's correct, yeah. Oh. They, they believe that we're all headed inevitably for an apocalypse, and that Scientology and the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard alone is the only thing that will save us from our trajectory for nuclear annihilation. A lot of Scientology is a very Cold War era type philosophy. Um, and a lot of what I think kind of jazzed Elrond about the Cold War and working with the CIA and, and, and spycraft and all those elements, it just really kind of wove its way into the actions of Scientology agents. And, to, you know, to be fair, there's a certain level of Scientologists that are only privy to this kind of information. Sure. At the lower levels, you're still taking classes, you're auditing, you're maybe scrubbing toilets, you know, for just, you know, a handful of chains a day. You're not necessarily some sort of, like, secret agent. But right. certainly at the top levels, they're well, well, well aware that this constant evolving level of damage control and, you know, under miscavige is all, I mean, a lot of the stuff has still been going on. Yeah. So it was called a fair game policy, which they claim is no longer in action, but it's absolutely untrue. And you can find a lot of evidence even currently of, you know, Scientology agents running around with cameras trying to film conventions. Sure. Okay, well, the last... Uh, you know, trying to, uh, uh, 
um, surveil on on who is speaking and you know sending private detectives like literally living in the house across from Marty Rathburn for like two three years. I mean they still work in the same aggressive fashion. But that's what people need to understand is that like you know when you have that kind of fanatical vision that there is a at all costs and to what end kind of philosophy behind it. What a great... I mean, if I literally view that I'm trying to save the world and you're getting in my way, well, what is it to, to crush your enemy? Nothing. Right. Well, let me, let me say this. The last time you were on the show, you left us with a cliffhanger, and I'm going to try to peel that thing open now because we do have a bit of time left, hopefully, for, with you. You mentioned last time, and, and it's fascinating the way you describe, you know, creating this backlash and creating... Um, what's going to come back and, and hurt you, basically, with this organization. Because that is exactly the term dreamed up by the CIA called blowback. And that's a term whenever you go into a country and you do, you know, say a lot of things that might upset them. I know maybe you might think you're defending yourself, but it works out that you're invading another country without even having the balls to declare war. And then when you're in there doing that right. kind of thing, um, and then you didn't have to say, well, I'll declare war. You know, they just they took a few shots at us, so we had to shoot back. It's okay. And this is a very serious situation we are now in vis-a-vis -vis blowback because anybody that was intelligent and on top of things and paying attention to things knew that Rumsfeld was lying about the weapons of mass destruction and all of that stuff. And we went over into Iraq, and we turned that place upside down, and people like me, and probably you, I don't know, but lots of other folks were saying back then, hey, if you do that based on this ridiculous notion that Iraq has anything to do with 9-11, we're going to have a big steaming pile of ugly mess down the road. And, of course, people like us were called, uh, you know, paranoid lunatics and, and whatever. But, of course, we now do have the down the road has happened, and we do have this ISIS and whatever the hell they are over there. And... Uh, causing all kinds of problem, regardless of who's paying for it and funding it and putting it together and, and, and setting them down with their multi-camera 5.1 sound remix video shoots of, of guys getting killed, like it's a rock video. Aside from the prowess of Allah in manipulating video editing material uh, that was invented by Western people. To, <laughs> you know, they're so full of shit. Anyway, oh, am I not supposed to swear? Okay, boss. Anyway, the point I would like to say is that you... Jamie DeWolf, last time, way up inside the, the snake hole of what it is to understand Scientology, shared with us on the show by way of ringing off and saying goodbye that you know for a fact the Nation of Islam, whatever that might mean to people, but your take on it, the Nation of Islam has a very powerful connection to Scientology. And now that all of this crazy news has come and, and put itself into our faces since you and I last spoke, I have to ask you, with their cunning, political, organized efficiency, uh, that they don't take opponents lightly, that they have actually broken into a la Watergate, government offices, etc. Tell us more, please, Jamie, if you know anything, about the connection of Scientology and the ongoing frightening sideshow that is ISIS and any kind of connections with Islam, which, I, and hey, I'm not even connecting Islam with ISIS itself. That's not my job to do. I see it as an aberration. But do you have any background from what I've just well, spoken about? Well, I will say what I know from personal experience, and there's absolutely someone who knows a lot more about this and has taken on the, the definitely the heavy weight of exposing this because it's, it's absolutely mind-bogglingly insane. Um, but when I went out to Clearwater, Florida, recently there was an anti-Scientology summit where a lot of brave souls literally went into the mouth of the lion and to was, you know, widely viewed as one of the religious meccas of Scientology, which is Clearwater, Florida. And, you know, I mean, they own nearly the entire city. And a lot of Clearwater, Florida, why it became that, that kind of a mecca is because it's pretty much where Elrond um, got tired of floating around on his cruise ships and escaping all kinds of different countries, landed ground and just consumed the entire city by buying up all kinds of real estate and just moving in. And they pretty much have won and made this into a stronghold and have these enormous, you know, pieces of real estate and hotels that they've taken over. And they do the highest levels of Scientology teaching out there. And so it's pretty brave for all these people to show up and, and speak and, and uh, you know, tell their stories about being in and out of the church. 
to to anyone that that is is there. And so, I mean, that was a pretty crazy experience of itself. It was the the second time I'd been to Clearwater since I first spoke out about it in uh, 2000. And so it was um, a bit of a return. But I met a guy there named Ishmael Day, who had been a member of the Nation of Islam, and he had noted in his own personal experience what he had witnessed and that he had evidence that showed that Scientology and the Nation of Islam had been making inroads in with each other and had been making deals that had then been verified of giving Nation of Islam money, um, giving them access to locations and space, and actually giving low levels of Scientology to young Nation of Islam members because they're trying to make inroads into that community. And actually seeing video of Elijah Muhammad holding up, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Elijah Muhammad, but the current leader holding up uh, Farrakhanis, I believe, holding up a, com- a, a copy of Dianetics and actually stating that, like, you know, some of the real truth is in here. And that was just, like, one of the most disturbing and, and out there wackety things I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> to understand how this uh, ferociously paranoid um, and very white, uh, you know, kind of super sneaky, crazy corporate cult like Scientology <laughs> attempting to partner with an equally strong and fierce and fanatical organization was to seem like a marriage made in hell. I don't think they have anything or any kind of connection to ISIS. I don't know anything about that. Um, but Ishmael Bay would be a fantastic guest for you to have on your show okay. for you to talk about because he's done a lot of research into it. And a lot of it is that because he's absolutely horrified of seeing them attempting to make these inroads into his community and from where he's from. Um, probably because, you know, El Ram was also a, a racist and wasn't particularly like a friend to the African American community. Yeah. And so a lot of this is, is even more horrifying because it's, it's completely a paradox in of itself and it reeks of money and it reeks of opportunism. Yeah. And so I think that there's a lot to be said and a lot to be investigated in terms of that. Oh, we don't do any of that, <laughs> Jamie. No, no, no. We can't investigate anything. We just have to accept it, and it rolls through, and that's that. Have you not seen this? That's the new plan now. <laughs> you just you just open it up and, and, and say, yeah, we're going to go do this, and people follow. You don't need to declare war. You don't need to investigate anything. You just say, I believe this. We're going in, and people go, yeah. Anybody else that disagrees with this is anti-American. I mean, there's a different climate now. Well, the question is, the question is now is that when, you, when you're an American, is that even with the Iraq War, with, uh, you know, you look back in the days of, even World War II, it's like, you know, Hitler at least would, would pull some false flag operations, but he would literally have the evidence enough to try to stage it. You know, he would put sure. the Polish soldiers in, all, in the costumes, you know, and, and shoot them and try to have evidence to justify war. I mean, the fact that we didn't even fabricate weapons of mass destruction <laughs> shows how little they can they have to care. I mean, it's, it's basically once you get in there and you start the war, then it's like, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to yeah. stop it? Well, that's, that's, I just had this comment last week with another guest, a great guy, Barry Zwicker. And, and before I leave, I have to make sure we get you the name of that men- you're mentioning. I have to spell it correctly. But a long time ago, you were called. Um, you could get into some pretty serious political trouble by saying something that was perceived to be less than intelligent by some of us. For example, if you recall Dan Quayle having a tough time with the word potato, and we shredded that guy, and he said a couple other stupid things, all pre-internet, but it was enough for the late-night hosts and everybody else to just completely destroy any kind of credibility. And how did his political career uh, go after that? Non-existent. And yet today, that was then, in the 90s, in the late 80s. Now today, you can say something like, I absolutely support removing all of the troops from Iraq, one year, and a year later say, we are putting more troops into Iraq, and this is totally fine. You know, there, there's no... <laughs> <laughs> it seems like there's no one being held to account for hypocrisy anymore, maybe because no one cares. Uh, I don't know, but right. it, it's it's difficult to think that— no, I think I think apathy has risen an all-time high. I think that the situation in the Middle East is either a confusing bet or is either being controlled or it's just kind of descending into utter chaos. I mean, a lot of it is that militaristically it makes no sense. You can't, 
you can't just simply start a civil war in a country, then leave, and then expect for the country to stabilize themselves, and then also expect that after you've bombed half the country and disposed its leaders, put sure. in puppet leaders of itself, to expect that suddenly the region is going to embrace and and respect our country, you know, and embrace our values. That's just the distorted American thinking. It's, it's either just it's it's kind of psychotic self image of of the love the world shares for America, or it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's either that we are that stupid and then actually believe people are going to embrace our ideals and values, or that's just the kind of running joke that they say, well, we kind of do whatever we need to do to pursue our interests. I mean, actually naming the, you know, the second Iraq war, the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom was one of the most insulting jokes I've ever heard in my life. For Americans, for, you know, your southern bread, like flag waving, tobacco, you know, spitting American to actually pretend that they cared about the life of an Iraqi was like so insulting to me. That was just so ludicrous. It was like, why, why are you suddenly pretending that you care about a Muslim country? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That <laughs> you've been at war with. That's the most ludicrous thing ever. Oh, oh we got to, you know, protect their freedom. It was like, well, I'm sorry, when did that matter to you? Why did that matter to you overnight when we couldn't find weapons of mass destruction? And then now you want to bomb them, now you want to kill them, and then now you want to free them. I got it. Okay, that makes sense. We have to defend it somehow. Mm. You really are one of the only people, and I guess you know that, who can who can go so dark into some of these rabbit holes. Um, I hope it's. I hope you're okay still. You know, with a, I hope you're fine. You got to get through this mess that we have in our lives sometimes, and and you've been right inside the belly of that beast, and I just find it so fascinating and, and helpful that you'll share this information to anyone that will listen. Great. Well, thank you very much. There's a great event coming up uh, soon. On April 26th, it's in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. So if you don't live in Ontario, you probably need to look that up. And um, I've got someone on the line who is going to tell us all about that great event and what it is and the name of it and who's involved. Here he is, Nelson Thaw, one of the great contributors to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. He not only does that, he also uh, contributes to a lot of other programs and shows. And this wonderful event coming up. Nelson, how are you? Great, Alan. It's a real pleasure for you to have me on. Thank you very much. It is a real pleasure for me. How, do, how did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for uh, coming on. Actors, I think. It's a pleasure for me to be on. Well, it is a pleasure for you to hear me. Uh, so I'm just kidding. So listen, you've got a cool event coming up on April 26th, and this is, a, gonna, this is encompassing a lot of great speakers talking about things conspiracy. And you yourself are also presenting. Um, what are you presenting? I'm going to be presenting on my expertise is unpacking the Zapruder film. In the early 70s, I touched base with uh, Jim Garrison and Penn Jones, District Attorney Garrison. I met him through Penn Jones and was able to arrange for a copy of the Zapruder film. And I brought it back from Dallas in 1972. And it was illegal at that time to hold, have possession of. Remember, it was filmed by Abraham Zapruder in Dealey Plaza on November 22, 1963. Time Life bought it, and it was given used by the Warren Commission. And then it was sealed away for 75 years in the archives, not to be released. I was uh, Jim Garrison in 69 when he subpoenaed the film uh, uh, for the Clay Shaw trial, was able to whip off over the lunchtime hour. He himself whipped off illegally a copy of it. And it was from that version that I was able to get a copy from him and brought it back to Canada and got it aired on border stations in 1973. Okay, that's a fascinating story. Let, let's just go back a little bit. So you obtained the Zapruder film itself, or a copy of it? A copy of it, not the original. No, a copy a copy of it. Right, that's the one your friend made. And then you obtained this in California? Or where'd you get it? I got it from uh, Penn Jones in, in Dallas. In Dallas. Okay, so now you're, <laughs> you're this young guy. You have a filmed copy that's illegal to have of the President uh, Kennedy getting killed. And then you have to get it back to Canada. So yeah. that must have been fun. Yeah, that was quite interesting. Well, what I did was I had it so that Penn Jones would meet me at the Dallas airport. And um, and uh, in those years, there was no security at the airport. And so any guest could come meet you, sure. not just at the 
arrivals level. Put you right on the plane. He could come right to the to the gate. Yeah. And uh, Penn came to the gate, and uh, we did a little baton pass, so made it look like he. Uh, we had it hidden in a book. By the way, we had it hidden in a copy of uh, Tragedy and Hope. Oh, that's my Penn. favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> you took a copy of a, a relatively hard to obtain blueprint of what's wrong with the world. Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope. You cut pages and holes out of it like in Mission Impossible to put this Kennedy tape in. That yeah, is the yeah. coolest thing I've ever heard from a guy yeah. that I know. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So you're going to talk about this and, and many, many more act- things. I'm sorry. I say you're going to talk about this and many, many more things at uh, at the event on the 26th of April. Yeah, I'm going to talk about not just how I got a hold of it, but more than that, I'm going to show the smoking gun quality of it and how why it is such a valuable piece of film. Now, this is something that a lot of people um, have already seen or think they've already seen. So why is your um, why is your take on it any different from everybody else that's watched that thing a hundred times? Well, actually, um, I put it together with uh, some tape from a, a journalist report, the only journalist who was able to view it Dan Rather, and that's not usually done, that people show the film and the headshot and juxtapose that against Dan Rather's report about what he saw, because Dan Rather was the only man in the world, uh, an obscure Texas reporter, who was allowed to see the film on behalf of the nation and comment and report on it. And so we juxtapose that, and we're going to examine certain frames of the Zapruder film that are smoking guns that really show how the single bullet theory is just fantasy. So is Abraham Zapruder, you know, an actor, or or is he a real guy who was down there that day with a camera and, and took those pictures? Yeah, Abraham Zapruder just happened to show up at that time uh, and, and to Dealey Plaza with his camera and shoot this film. Okay, so he's not an actor as far as you're concerned. No, no, there was a real Abraham Zapruder. He was a Dallas dressmaker, just a simple, ordinary guy, just took his camera down to watch the, the mm. president's motorcade and, buy, and just happened to catch this great piece of history. Right. Now, okay. now there's no doubt that the Zapruder film has been altered. Uh, however, uh, the copy that I had was w- one that even then they had, it was a copy given to the Warren Commission and it had been altered. But in spite of being altered, they still did not take out the smoking gun part of it that shows, of course, that John F. Kennedy was shot from the front, not from the rear, as where, w- w- which is the official story. Sure. Yeah, well, it sounds like a great night a great evening with uh, some incredible information going on. Mrs. Steele will be there that night, and she's going to be presenting on another interesting topic, which is the lost and found tribes of Israel, the lost, the, with the famous 10 lost tribes. She's going to show where they are today. That's Jane Steele. She'll be there. Also, we have um, Gary Chang. He is uh, talking about the mystery of the Holy Shroud. Of course, you mentioned Jane Steele yourself talking about the uh, uh, Zapruder film. And, of course, uh, Rosemary Ellen Gully on spirit communication, Ali Slatatan on UFOs, gods, and angels. Um, Canada's Edgar Casey, a wonderful uh, um, researcher and writer and experiencer of things other realm-wise. Dr. Douglas J. Cottrell will be there. They call him Canada's Edgar Casey. He's going to talk about remote viewing and, and terrorism in the sky from Dr. John Hall, talking about um, satellite terrorism in America. You can get online to get this at um, zlandcommunications.blogspot.ca. That's one place, Z or Z, L-A-N-D, communications.blogspot.ca. And you'll find there the ZNN event notice of the, um, what will we call this? This is, um, what's follow, the official name of it? The Follow the Truth 2 conference. And they can also uh, look up more information at uh, the Follow the Truth conference or richardsurrett.com. Oh, okay, and then here's another one, followthetruth.tv. Oh, so, sorry, so followthetruth.tv, yes. That's okay. Yeah. We all do that. And uh, yeah. it's April 26th, we're talking about the money mafia, psychic spies, UFOs, JK, JFK's cover-up, and the Holy Shroud. So that's that's quite an evening of conversation. And if you take this in and go to work tomorrow, uh, I'm sure you won't be talking about what was on TV last night. Definitely check it out. It's at uh, April 26th. 
That's a Sunday, 7 p.m. at the Regent Theater in Oshawa. Nelson, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks uh, very much, Alan. Much appreciated. Thanks for listening to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Please offer comments or complaints by emailing conspiracyqueries at gmail.com or on Twitter at con underscore queries or at our website, conspiracyqueries.com. Thanks for listening. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, the secret, secret oaths, and the secret proceedings. The show that asks questions about why we don't ask questions. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Welcome to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. These are the conspiracy queries that Alan Park is asking. And some people are listening. And you're one of them. So thanks. And there's a lot of people popping up around the world. So that's nice. Um, I really appreciate that. And and a lot of the letters and and comments that have been coming in um, on the different ways through Stitcher and, and Twitter and Gmail and everything, it's fantastic. So thanks for listening. And I'm glad some of you are enjoying what is happening here, at least um, interested enough to find out. We have a great guest today. Jamie DeWolf is back, and he's going to talk about Scientology. Now, um, as I said before, uh, everybody has a crazy uncle. <laughs> you don't have anything on Jamie DeWolf. He's got a crazy great-grandfather uh, that were, these guys were uh, heavily, well, they are, Scientology. And he is the, um, he is the spurned son. He, he realized what a scam that was and decided to um, write about it, expose it. And uh, performance art, poetry, acting, he's a heck of a guy, fascinating individual, and I think uh, deserves uh, the tip of the hat for being able to take what what I think would be a horrible upbringing and turn it into something um, that's beneficial for not only his his own self, but everybody else. So Jamie DeWolf in a couple of minutes. And before that, before that, we also have um, a fantastic, I've already said that too many times, we have a a great event coming up in Oshawa um, for you folks that need to get more information than is on the what they call the news. And uh, it's coming up at the end of April. And one of the purveyors of information is a guest on the show, Nelson Thal. He is going to come on in a couple of minutes and talk about this event that you don't want to miss if you're in the GTA and, as they say, the greater Toronto area or southern Ontario um, or just even over the border into New York. How are you guys doing over there? Rochester, snow, Buffalo. Wow, you're back. Um, welcome. So he's going to be on in a little bit. But before we get to any of this, um, I guess you guys all heard about what happened in France and how there were shootings. And some people on my show and others have said that these shootings were not necessarily as um, as shown and that there was some uh, secret weird kind of manipulation going on. That's definitely the case in Canada with Operation Determined Dragon, the DND military operation that enveloped, completely surrounded the window of time that the guys uh, that were killed in Canada, the uh, unfortunate victims of bullets flying from crazy people, no doubt. That is not in question. What's in question was ultimately who was in control, who was pulling the trigger. Um, Why did the American media know the name and identity of the shooter in Canada before the Canadian media did? And then sort of, you know, not mention that again. CBS had that thing within 10 or 20 minutes of, of him uh, shooting it up. But we didn't in Canada. We didn't know, but they did. I love how the states always knows things is going on somewhere else, but never what's going on right above, say, New York City's giant skyscrapers and maybe the biggest military installation in the world. We weren't too sure what was going on that day. Took them all day to figure it out. But somehow if a, if a plane <laughs> disappears from the Ukraine area, they know right away. Definitely it's Russia's fault. They're right in, wired in. Oh, yeah, it's completely believable. Anyway. Uh, so France had this unfortunate, terrible shooting at the Charlie Hebdo satirical magazine. And, and the leaders came out later and said, Je suis Charlie. And they marched around in a similar looking street that was cordoned off by police so that the precious friggin' leaders wouldn't have to sully their clothes with actual protests. While they artificially said, yes, yes, 
Freedom of speech, zeer sweet Charlie. So now let's now let's bring you up to date on what's happening. Here's an article by Thierry Meissen. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's a French gentleman, and I'm not. T h i e r r y m e y s s a n. This fella also wrote a great explanation of how things uh, didn't really sit too well with him, 9/11 explanation wise. And so on the VoltaireNet.org, it says, at the request of President Francois Hollande. <clears throat> The French Prime Minister. You in France or Norway or, or South America, you can replicate the same process. And what was happening with Dianetics, the people are taking Dianetics and they didn't need L.O. and Hubbard anymore. And they're starting to go off in their own way and develop and use these tools and tricks and so forth. And, you know, you don't want that to happen with, with religion without you able to get a, a piece of the proceeds. Um, the problem is now, though, is that there's something he basically wrote into it that I alone am the only one that can ever write or edit or change any word of it. And the problem is, though, that that sticks them with the more kind of psychotic levels of Scientology with your Xenu levels and your, you know, the space <laughs> infestations of alien dead souls in your body. So you can't really change that because it's, it's written into the entire script. And so the best thing they can do now is just keep shoving the same product on their members. And I think that that's what's exhausting a lot of even the old vanguard who are at this point, you know, kind of leaving in droves because the, you know, the, there's just nothing left to sell. Nothing left. Wow. Well, tell us this then. Um, well, before we do that, let's let's just take a quick break and, and jump away. We are listening to uh, Jamie DeWolf. He's the guest today on Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park, Sirius XM Channel 167. We'll be right back. As I said, we are right back, and we're with Jamie DeWolf, and uh, he is telling us about Scientology. Jamie, the last time we spoke, you were telling me about how uh, your, your grandfather was kind of an enforcer, keeping everybody to the task of the uh, religion or whatever it was at the idea at the time, a fantasy, a science fiction. But he held them to this. And then later, through the course of time and, and, and the uh, organization being around for quite some many years— it is a, as you've described it, highly organized and efficient opponent, and that it has, um, when I say opponent, it has any, anybody that counters it, I guess, would, would count as an opponent. And also tell us something a little bit about the mentality of an organization that is, you know, supposed to be the answer, but at the same time they are highly organized, efficient opponent and, and very wise and, and had a thing going on called Operation Snow White, which sounds more like a military application of, of intelligence than anything else. Do you, can you fill in some blanks there? When my grandfather first started in Scientology, this is L. Ron Hubbard Jr., when he first became a member of Scientology and worked with his father, the very kind of easy hustle of Scientology is you come in under the presumption that you're going to be doing a course of self-betterment. And while doing that course, you do with auditing sessions, which is basically kind of version uh, uh, psychiatry you know, session of hypnosis. And you're holding a form of, of a lie detector, basically, sort of, an, it's called an e-meter. And you're kind of subjecting yourself to this kind of hypnotic interrogation that is going to be digging through your past traumas, your, your secrets, your sexuality, your, um, you know, everything that has ever, ever triggered you throughout most of your life. Okay. Now, a lot of this is sort of the, the idea that you're going to be becoming a better human being by discussing all these things. But what they don't really tell you and, and what's often not focused on is that they record all of your confessions, and if you try to leave, they're going to use it against you. And that's what my grandfather would do constantly when he had people trying to leave the church, especially if they're thinking in a good amount of cash, is they had already confessed their infidelities, their uh, sexual proclivities, and, you know, he had a lot of that on file. <clears throat> and himself, as, you know, as a bit of an auditor, that that was a way for him to push people to, you know, not go too far from the church and make sure that they came back. Wow. And so when he even saw that early on that there was this whole other darker apparatus of Scientology that was getting constructed, part of that was because Elrond was so absolutely paranoid at kind of a base level because in a way, as a good con man, he was always aware 
of the different angles that people could come at him for. He had a lot to hide. He had a lot of money he needed to funnel. He had uh, sort of a, kind of a fanatical faction that was starting to surround him. And he began to create his own secret police, um, which in the early days was known as the Guardian Office. And which is now that their tale itself is the same tale you're seeing now um, that's even happening with people leaving the church, like Marty Ratburn and Mike Rinder and so forth, two people who are at the top level and they're involved in many kind of criminal activities in, in terms of using the cult power against its own members and anybody that would try to bring forth the truth. And then when they leave, they're also suffered. I mean, they're subjected to the same sort of, of aggression that they had enacted on their own members before. And, you know, inevitably they, they try to unveil the truth. Except the difference is now is that, of course, that L. Ron Hubbard is, is long gone and David Miscavige has taken that role. David Miscavige, yes. And and so with these, uh, you've been on both sides of the issue. You, you've seen it from the the Scientology world, from from a place of, a lot of your family members being greatly concerned and upset that this is even going on, and then other ones actually championing the cause uh, as a wonderful thing, and that that's a bit of a, a tug of war for you to grow up in. Right, absolutely. I mean, there's so much fear that surrounds it. Um, you know, and absolutely our family wanted to protect us from really getting drowned in this entire kind of cesspool and to keep us from it as, as far as possible. And I think part of it is that I wanted to understand who who my great grandfather was, and as being a redhead, and you know, having to engage in sort of duels with psychiatrists when I was an adolescent, and trying to understand my own sort of like mental history, along with that of my brother, who were both pretty hyper when we were young, and and had a lot of problems in school, and, and kind of tendencies towards youthful violence and, and that kind of stuff. That. Um, you know, it's changed and evolved over time, and it's something that's a lot more healthy. But back then, trying to understand who this guy actually was and realizing that he was an enigma to even most of my family, um, and and that there was this entire terror of anyone poking around this freaking giant that they felt that their own father, um, you know, uh, Elrond Jr., had basically had been consumed by. And, and so even now, there's some family members that won't talk about it at all, and they, they're not even really that interested in discussing it. Um, it still has a certain amount of menace associated with it. Sure. And then I have other family members who, you know, in a way, they, they either privately or publicly, like, kind of champion the fact that I ended up coming out and, and speaking about it. Um, probably because I, I realized that, that the story of my grandfather isn't that well-known of Elrond Jr., and it's, it's a pretty haunting story in a way, and I think that there's something so identifiable in a son and a father wrestling with each other and, and, and sort of turn, you know, turning their own lives into ashes as they battle each other. And in a way, Elrond Jr., when he came out, he was one of the first people who was actually really pushing for more of an honest portrayal of who his father really was. And was crucified pretty early on for it. Mm. So, and now, how do you spend most of your time? What is it that you do about this? You're obviously not keeping it a secret anymore. You're on this show and many others talking about it. But what what is your goal now with having seen it as dark as it is and, and, and getting out from underneath of it, Scientology? Well, a lot of it is, to be honest, is I'm a performer and a filmmaker, and I do shows all over the U.S., all over the world, and, you know, plays and films and so on and so forth and a lot of it is that when I first performed a story about it I, I really just wanted to have a story out there and just sort of tell my family's story because I felt that it wasn't it hadn't really been told and a lot of that was mostly just for my family and for those who didn't want to speak and I think now when I get requests to talk I usually grant them if I can partly because I think it's important that that these kinds of stories aren't silenced that they get exposed, and I mean, because I don't, I don't view them as a religion. I view them as a criminal organization. Um, they've been, you know, they have billions of dollars in assets, and they have been, you know, they've been accused, and, and there's a lot of evidence for 
slave labor camps and forcing women to have abortions. And, wow. you know, and the fact is that, I mean, their entire Messiah figure was a pathological liar. And <laughs> yeah. so everything that has become an extension from that, um, the sad fact of it is, is that he got everything he wanted. He died rich. He died with this entire army in his disposal. He died insulated. He died with you know, thousands of people believing this fictitious tale that he told about himself, but he's gone. So to conti- continue to exploit the members and continue to exploit the world um, simply because of his purposes and his agenda that he had set in stone is no longer necessary. So it's like the least we can do is expose him for who he truly, truly was and you know, allow people to, to make their own decisions. So these days it's, it's being run in operated or uh, uh, captained, shall we say, a bit of an in-joke, um, with with this David Miscavige. And so he's not, um, he's not any of the uh, actual Scientologists, you know, the, the, the genetic link that is the, uh, the Hubbard family. And does he therefore have an easier time uh, selling this stuff, not in his name, the way the way uh, those other guys were hanging it, uh, you know, on the very, on the very selves, you know, it's like I invented this thing, and obviously Miss Cabbage didn't and doesn't say he does. So does he have an easier time, as you say, running this thing, um, like a very wise uh, opponent, a political organization? Yeah, I think that David Miss Cabbage basically runs it like a lieutenant or an administrator or a very brutal CEO. And I think that there is a lot to be said. And what they're hoping for is that stre- that stretch of time where when someone dies, you can continue to add more myth to their legend. And at a certain point, make someone you know larger than life and someone that is less and less connections with reality. The problem is that Elrond was spinning these tales when he was still alive and he had living evidence that was saying otherwise. He had his own family. He had his own son. You know, he had his own military record. And what happens now is when you play the game where you try to spin this entire myth of who L. Ron Hubbard was, who, of course, is now gone and doesn't have to go on record, doesn't have to have a microphone shoved in his face. And David Miscavige can basically just continue to echo the same propagated falsehoods that Elrond said about himself. Um, the difference is, and, and sort of the weakness of that, though, is David Miscavige is not Elrond Hubbard and doesn't have, or even really pretend to, have the same kind of hustler charisma that he did. And at the same time, Elrond wrote kind of a fatal flaw into the DNA of Scientology theology, which is that no one can add to it but him. So oh. they're absolutely stuck with this theology and this kind of um, <laughs> pyramid, scam, pyramid scam that can't add any more steps. Even the Christians there's, figure there's no that out. I mean, even stuff. even after a while, the Pope was able to say, okay, okay, the world is really round. We were wrong about this. Sorry, Copernicus. You know, at exactly. least they got to fudge the Pope, it. The Pope and... <laughs> in the last 30 years can actually, actually uh, decide that purgatory was a theological hypothesis and just eliminated entirely. I personally, I do like when they come up with those, though. Uh-huh. I, I do personally enjoy the adjustments based on um, uh, impending, you know, unavoidable logic and fact. That okay, okay, we used to say this, now we're going to say this. But Scientology does not have that angle. No, I mean, it, it, partly it's because when Dianetics first came out, and what a lot of people don't really seem to get... And I think it's a very strong, uh, fundamental, like, kind of underpinning to the evolution of Scientology itself is that it originally was not meant to be, it was not designed to be a religion. Right. It was designed to be a science. You know, L. Ron Hubbard really postulated himself as uh, a scientist. That's why he really pushed for this kind of, um, you know, he had taken these nuclear physics classes and had, you know, studied with all of these great fountains of wisdom is that Dianetics, when it originally came out, was you know the new science of the modern mind. It was meant to be a science, not a religion. And the problem is when you have something in science, you actually need case studies, you actually need evidence. And so when he was starting to get grilled and roasted on that, then he transformed into a religion. But we also realized, though, that when you teach a science, a science has to be something that can be replicated, right? If I, you know, if I teach you how to... 
doing kind of a scientific process. There's a list of steps for it. That- the French Socialist Party has published a note on the international conspiracy theorist movement. His goal to prepare new legislation prohibiting it to express itself. That's right. The French government is trying to set up a series of laws where it will be illegal to discuss conspiracy. Wow. You know, if I tried to come up with a better way in one sentence to prove that conspiracies are real, I would never have been smart enough to come up with that. (laughs) I've never been smart enough to come up with, um, don't ever talk about this, okay? That just reeks of conspiracy. But, you know, speaking of reeks, Francois Hollande's probably eating some kind of French cheese while he dreamed this thing up. His goal is to prepare new legislation prohibiting it to express itself. In the U.S., September 11, 2001, coup established a permanent state of emergency, the Patriot Act, launching a series of imperial wars. Gradually, the European elites have aligned with their counterparts across the Atlantic. Everywhere, people are worried about being abandoned by their states and they question their institutions seeking to retain power. The elites are now ready to use force to gag their opposition. That's what's happening with the five eyes, as far as I can see it. Edward Nor- uh, Snowden. I was going to say Edward Norton. I should probably play him in the movie. Um, they've got the five eyes where everybody spies on everybody in the big countries, you know. New Zealand spies on Australia, who spies on England, who spies on Canada, who spies on the United States, and then they have a plausible deniability. And I used to have a joke in my act years ago. Why don't they have the balls to just... Tell everybody, hey, we're going to look at what you guys are doing instead of fobbing it off onto the neighbors and plausible. Di- and that's what they're doing now. My ridiculous joke of 10 years ago has actually come true. That's disappointing. So, um, yeah. So Francis, uh, what's his name? Francois Hollande says. Anti-Semitism maintains conspiracy theories that spread without limits. Conspiracy theories that have in the past led to the worst whatever that means, the answer is to realize that conspiracy theories are disseminated through the Internet and social networks. So don't look at information and don't hang out with your friends. Moreover, we must remember that it is words that have in the past prepared extermination. Yeah, we need to act at the European level and even internationally so that a legal framework can be defined so that Internet platforms that manage social networks are held to account and that sanctions be opposed for failure to enforce. Folks like me that are happy to reveal that these people are lying you into an unfree poorhouse. And they are kicking up those surveillance towers. And we got to stop this thing. I don't know how. I don't know how. I don't have any... I'm not going to say guns and killing and all that. I'm not going to do that kind of thing. That's not interesting to me. And I don't think it's the right answer. And it's what got us into the mess in the first place. So, with that kicking around your head, let's find out a little bit more from uh, Jamie DeWolf now. We're going to start off with him, and the reason I wanted to have him back on the show is because he has uh, some pretty fascinating theories about the origins of ISIS and Scientology. So, stick around and uh, listen to some great interviews. We've got two of them, so let's go to our first interview, and then we'll go to our second interview. Jamie is um, knows a lot about Scientology. I'm going to venture probably more than you. And we'll cover a little ground about um, who Jamie is and why he knows these things. It's available on the previous show from last year, but we'll just do a quick once-over about Jamie's grandfather and some other people just to kind of catch you up. L. Ron Hubbard was actually my great-grandfather, and my grandfather was L. Ron Hubbard Jr., and then my mother was his first child. So I think one of the I think one of the most fascinating parts of my family history is, is not just the L. Ron Hubbard but the L. Ron Hubbard Junior as well. Because I think within their story um is basically kind of the narrative of a lot of the church itself. You have someone that became an early disciple and then helped construct the church, was also involved in some of its kind of abusive and physicalized violence at an early level and ended up leaving the church and was silent for a bit when he came out and then eventually he started to turn towards unveiling who his father actually was and then paid a very steep price for it and basically spent much of the end of his life battling his father and, and being consumed by the cold and fighting against his security apparatus. And 